Hi folks and uh, welcome to our online congregation and thanks for tuning in and joining us here at the Tabernacle each week. Your faithfulness is so much appreciated. Now we've got a great lineup tonight, our worship band, our choir and then at the pulpit, uh, Pastor David Purse, our senior pastor, bringing the word. So stay tuned for a great night of worship and praise here at Whitewell. Let's go live. Wherever I in the house of the Lord this evening. It's good to see you here also. You're welcome in this place. And we're going to continue the worship. Um, at this point, I would like to invite you to stand. Stand with us. And as you stand, why not greet each other? Say hello to the people who are sitting next to you and make them feel welcome in this place. You are the love that frees us. You are the 
Give the Lord the glory this evening. It's good to be able to lift our voices. That's one for a cold night to get you warmed up. Let's change the tempo somewhat and let's sing Sovereign over us. There is strength within sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you lead us in our morning with the love that casts our fear. You are working in our waiting. You sanctify in us. Oh, and beyond our understanding. Teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever. You're perfect in
Let's all pray. Precious Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, that we're loved by you. We thank the Lord for your lovely Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord what he means to each and every one of us. Where would we be without you, Father? And Lord, we ask you for your people tonight. You see the issues that your people are going through, so many and so vast. We just ask you for all those who are going through sickness, all those who are going through bereavement, especially we, George Irvine, Lord. Just be with George and his family and others who have went through bereavement recently. And Lord, there's people here tonight waiting on their loved ones to pass away. Just be with them, Father, Lord. Be everything that they need. Be round about them. But we ask you, Lord, for tonight's meeting, Father. We ask you if there's hearts here that don't know you. Would you open those hearts, Lord? Open those hearts to receive your word, your precious word, because it's your word that came in and saved each and every one of us. Your word came in and changed us. Your word came in and turned us inside out, Father. So we pray for your word tonight, Lord, that it will plant in hearts, Lord, that it will open hearts, that it will break down barriers, that your name would be glorified. Just bless everything that's said and done, Father. For it's in your precious name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. in my heart I will sing as David sang when the spirit of the Lord is in my heart I will sing as David sang I will sing
Thank you, praise team. Let's show them our appreciation. Amen. Now the Tabernacle Choir is going to sing two pieces to us, and then Pastor David will come straight after to bring his God's words tonight. Let's make him welcome. Tabernacle Choir. streets of gold where the rescue love to dance and I've heard about the angels all singing to the land oh we are bound for we are bound for the city of joy well I've heard Sleeping 
trumpet sounds the sky will crack wide open and our feet come off the ground and I've heard that we will see him as all saints fly Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, choir, for ministering again faithfully to us this evening. If you have a Bible with you, would you please turn with me to the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, and we're going to just read two verses, verse number 30 and 31. I've entitled this tonight, a story of mercy in a courtroom. A story of mercy in a courtroom. So Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30. The apostle Paul is the speaker. He's in the city of Athens, ancient Athens, and he's on Mars Hill debating with the philosophers and the intelligentsia of the city. And in his sermon, he says these words to them. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day, a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this by raising him 
from the dead. We're going to stop there. May the Lord bless to us that short reading of his own precious word. Let's pray, shall we? Eternal and precious Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you, gracious Lord, for those two verses. We ask you now, Lord, will you take those two verses and will you write them upon our hearts? And gracious Lord, as we go through our subject tonight, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Holy Spirit, we ask you, will you come? Will you move from seat to seat? Will you move over this congregation? Will you speak to men and to women? Will you speak to young people? Would you speak to children? Would you speak to every one present tonight? And gracious Lord, let your word enter their spirit. Lord, I ask you tonight, will you open hearts? Lord, we read that during the week, how the Lord opened Lydia's heart in the city of Philippi. We ask you, Lord, here in the city of Belfast tonight, Holy Spirit, will you open many hearts. And for those tonight who know you not, for those tonight who are not saved, for those tonight, Lord, who are outside of Christ, Lord, open their hearts and speak to them and draw them to your lovely self. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Allow your imagination tonight to picture a great courtroom. At the front of this courtroom, there sits the formidable figure of the judge. And in front of him, lying open, there rests the books of the law he has pledged to uphold. Opposite him in the courtroom, a man and a woman stand nervously in the dock, while seated to their left sits the jury, who will consider the evidence and a judge if the accused are guilty or innocent. Also above them, interested parties watch in the public gallery as the trial proceeds. The evidence against the two accused is overwhelming. The accused couple wear fearful and concerned looks on their faces, and they can almost feel now the hangman's noose around their necks. The court is adjourned after all the evidence has been presented. It is adjourned to allow the jury to retire to consider their verdict. They return a short time later, and as each charge is read out by the court clerk, the spokesperson of the jury replies, guilty, 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 and guilty. He then takes his seat in the hushed courtroom. The judge now addresses the two accused. He speaks, you have been tried and found guilty of breaking the law. Before I pass sentence, have you anything you wish to say? The man looks at his partner in crime before gingerly standing to his feet. Your honor, he says, would you not show mercy? The judge replies, if I let you off, then justice and what is right will have been sacrificed. I must do what is right. The man sits down trembling, and the judge again addresses the guilty pair. Having been found guilty, the penalty for breaking the law, he says, must be applied. You will now be taken from this place to a place 
of execution. But just then, at that moment, there is a commotion. There's a moving, there's a stirring in the public gallery. A young man stands to his feet, and addressing the judge, he says, Your Honor, I will take their place, and I will bear their punishment. I will die in their place. I will die for them. And by so doing, the two accused can have the mercy that they need. And at the same time, the just demands of the law can also be upheld. A stunned courtroom watches as he makes his way down from the public gallery, right down to the floor of the courtroom, and then he proceeds to open the gate to the dock. Addressing the guilty pair, he asks them, do you want me to take your place? Amazed, they nod to him. Then he says, I will take your place. He exchanges places with them, and as the jailer leads him away, the judge begins to quietly weep and to sob and to cry. Why is he crying, whispers someone to the person next to him? Don't you know? Don't you know? The young man is the judge's only son. Ladies and gentlemen, that short illustration unfolds for us tonight the great mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's perfect and sinless Son who came here to earth to die on a cruel cross. The judge in the illustration represents Almighty God, our Creator and our Maker, with whom every one of us has to do. The books before him are the 66 books of the Bible, God's inspired Word, the statute book of heaven containing the whole body of heavenly law along with the perfect rules for a happy life. The two accused represent everyone who has ever lived. The two accused represent you, and they represent me. And the young man, the young man depicts the lovely Lord Jesus taking our guilty place and offering us a free, undeserved salvation and life for his death. There are three points I wish to make about this story I've just related. Number one, please notice, sir and lady, tonight the reality of this judgment. I want you to notice that, the reality of this judgment. Make no mistake about it. There is going to be a concluding, and there's going to be a deciding exam for the subject of the life that every one of us has lived. You can sidestep GCSEs. You can skip A-levels, but you cannot escape the examination at the end of the age in God's courtroom. The reality of this judgment. And friend, tonight, don't be surprised by this announcement because it has been fully advertised in the pages of Scripture. So there's no excuse. Every one of us will stand in God's courtroom. Stand to give an account. Stand to give an explanation of the life we have lived 
and our response to God's offer of salvation. So this judgment, ladies and gentlemen, has been advertised, advertised widely. Listen to our reading again tonight where it's declared, God now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. I don't know when that day is. I don't know when that time is. But I know tonight it's going to happen. The world cannot miss it. It is going to happen. And it will happen for every one of us. Listen again to Paul this time in Hebrews 9 and verse 27. He says, it is appointed. There's the second time that word is used, appointed, appointed, appointed. You can't miss it. It's been appointed. Listen to Paul. It is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. You can't skip it. You can't juke it. It is appointed unto men and women once to die, and that's not the end. And after this, the judgment. Listen this time to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. Listen to what John says. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, listen, and they were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Paul says in Acts 17, he says in Hebrews 9, it's appointed, it's certain, it's definite, it's appointed. And John says in Revelation 20, again, the books will be opened and all will be judged by the things written in those books. Sir and lady, tonight, as sure as tomorrow is Monday, and as sure as today is the 3rd of February, God has decreed, God has declared, there is going to be a judgment. There's going to be a courtroom. Will you say amen? That's the first thing. I want you to be aware of. Secondly, we need to be aware of why. What's the reason for this judgment? We've talked about the reality of it. But what is the reason for this judgment? It's very simple. The Bible announces, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at that word, all. No exceptions, none whatsoever. From the very first person created in Eden's garden that God breathed into their, his nostrils the breath of life, right down to the latest person born. Ladies and gentlemen, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, including me, Every one of us are sinners. 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 Spiritual criminals. And every day, one way or another, we break and we offend the law of God and the law of heaven. Every day, we sin with how we think. We sin with how we speak. And we sin by what we do. And we also sin by what we feel to do when we should do it in the first place. Every person here, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what walk of life you've come from, doesn't matter whether you live in an avenue or you live in a council flat, every one of us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the reason why there's going to be a judgment. 
Pastor, I'm not convinced. I'm a good person. I don't do anyone any harm. I do my best. Do you think so? Do you remember that great part of the Bible that's called the Ten Commandments? How do you fare in the light of the Ten Commandments? I wonder how many of us know the Ten Commandments tonight. What's the third commandment? What's the fifth commandment? What's the sixth commandment? What's the tenth commandment? How many of us know even the commandments tonight? Let's have a look at one or two of them and let's see how we fare. Let's take the eighth commandment. That's a good one. What's the eighth commandment? Thou shalt not steal. Sir, have you ever stolen? Pastor, you're getting very personal. I'm asking you a question. I'm not asking you to shout the answer, right, but I'm asking you to answer it honestly. In the confines and in the privacy of your heart, lady, have you ever stolen? Come on, think about it. Allow your mind to replay life. Have you ever stolen? Have you ever robbed? Have you ever thieved? God says, thou shalt not steal. Have you ever stolen? Tell me this. What do you call someone who steals? Oh, pastor, someone who steals. Well, call them a what? A thief. Isn't that right? You know what the Bible says about thieves? Listen to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. Thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. Powerful. Who's going to heaven? Who's not going to heaven? Listen to Paul, 1 Corinthians 6 and 10. He says, thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh boy, somebody's in trouble tonight. Listen to the ninth commandment. What does it say? Thou shalt not bear what? False witness. Pastor, what does that mean? Thou shalt not knowingly tell a lie. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many tonight have told a lie? How many tonight have told buckets of lies? There are people who live lies. God says in his word, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Again, I'm asking you, have you ever told a lie? You told your boss a lie this week? You were late for work because you didn't get out of bed in time and you told the boss that the bus was late? Thou shalt not bear false witness. What do you call someone? Aye, some bloke told the wife he'd be home at five o'clock. And he didn't come in at five o'clock because he was playing pool with the fellas. He told the wee wife, the, the car got stuck. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What do you call someone who lies? A liar. I can't stand a liar. Can't stand a liar. See, when you tell me a lie, I can't trust you again. Because when you talk to me, I'll be saying, I wonder is this another lie or I wonder is this the truth? God says in his word, thou shalt not bear false witness. Someone who tells a lie is called a liar. Listen to Revelation 21 and verse 8. And all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. Wow. Wow. Oh, someone's in trouble tonight. Someone's in trouble. What about the sixth commandment? What about the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now you may imagine, well, pastor, I'm all right in them ones. 
I hope you are. <laughs> Pastor, I'm all right on them ones. I've never committed adultery. I've never killed anyone. But friend, tonight Jesus says that if I lust after another man's wife, I have committed adultery in my heart. And Jesus further says that if I hate someone and if I wish them dead in my heart, I have committed murder in my heart. Is there a murderer here tonight? Is there an adulterer here tonight in your heart? You're walking out with the wife, but you're thinking of somebody else. God says you've committed adultery in your heart. You're in trouble. You look at someone and you hate them. You despise them. You wish they were dead. God says you're a murderer in your heart. Listen, brothers and sisters, to what the Bible says. And all murderers and the sexually immoral will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All oh, friends, tonight, in the light of God's law, there's lots of people and they're in big trouble. Is it any wonder that the Bible announces there is none righteous? No, not one. Friend, tonight at this very moment, you are under the condemnation of God. If you're a sinner, if you have broken his law, right now you are under the condemnation of God. Listen to Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 18 and verse 36. But he who does not believe in Christ is condemned already, and the wrath of God abides in him. Friend, tonight, what a bleak picture. What a depressing prospect. Pastor, can nothing be done? Is the eternal judge to slam the gavel down and address me and say to me, depart from me, you cursed, in the everlasting fire? Is there no hope? Is there no chance of a reprieve? Now we come to our final point tonight. The good news. Oh, that second part was all bad. That second part was all dark and foreboding. Now we come to the good part. Yes, friend, there is hope. Will you say amen? Yes, sir and lady, tonight, here's the good news. Here's the gospel. You see, you have to understand the bad part before you'll appreciate the good part Here's the gospel to every guilty sinner in this building tonight. Jesus Christ holds out mercy and freely, absolutely freely, he offers grace. Friend, come on tonight. Isn't that good news? Come on, isn't that great news tonight? To every guilty sinner, he holds out in his hand. Look at his hand. There's mercy in one hand. And there's grace and pardon in the other. Why? Why would he do this? The answer is found in one of the most famous verses of the whole Bible. Listen to what John 3 and 16 says. For God, come on, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why is there good news? Because God loves you. Do you hear me, sir, tonight? God loves you. Do you hear me, lady, tonight? God loves you. Do you hear me, friend, tonight? Heaven loves you tonight. I don't know why heaven loves you. I don't know why heaven loves me. But heaven does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. From heaven's balcony, the only son of the judge came down to a race in ruins and blighted by sin. He lived a sinless, spotless life. The law could not point its accusing finger at him. He was spotless, so much so that three times the Roman judge Pontius Pilate said concerning him, I find no fault in him. There's Jesus standing before the highest court in all of Judea, the Roman representative of Caesar, Pontius Pilate. And he examines him, he questions him, he interrogates him. And he says to the audience assembled, I find no fault in him. Ah, but this and ah, but I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. There was no reason, sir and lady, for Jesus to die. No reason whatsoever. But he had come to take the place of the guilty. The sinless one had come to take the place of the sinful. Isn't he lovely tonight? That's what he's about. That's what the gospel is about. The judge's son stands in the dock of an old rugged cross. He's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's been spat on. He's been crowned with thorns, and now he's pierced with spikes and nails and suspended between the earth and the sky. And there he allows, there he allows the guilt of every sin that you and I have ever committed to be placed upon him. And for those six hours from nine o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, noon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. For those six hours, because of our sins upon him, he became the most sinful person ever as he picks up the wages for our sins and the judgment of God which was ours, he willingly bears and accepts. Why is he dying? Because of your sin and mine. Why is he suffering? Because of your sin and mine. Why is he going through hell on that cross? because of your sin and mine, that we would be free, that we would be set free, that we would be released. That's why he's there on that cross. Oh, there had been previous outpourings of the deserved judgment of God for sin. Remember the great flood upon the world of Noah's day when God vented his anger at the sin of Noah's day. And we also think of the flaming inferno that God poured upon the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for their brazen immorality. But there on that tiny hill, and it's a small hill, if you've ever been there, if you've ever been to Israel, the place of the skull. There on that tiny hill called Calvary, the full weight, the full quota of God's judgment concentrated to its fullest strength was unleashed and allowed to fall upon the quivering, trembling form of the judge's only son. Can you hear him agonizing on the cross? Can you hear his agonizing cry? Oh, my God, my God, why? 
Have you forsaken me? He's paying the penalty for our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, at last, when the judge had accepted his substitutionary sacrifice, Jesus speaks. It is finished. The debt, the debt is paid in full. The debt paid in full, and he bows his head, and he breathed his last. Gospel writers tell us he gave up his spirit. The Roman legion didn't take his life from him. The Roman soldier didn't take his life from him when he was ready. When the debt had been fully paid, he says it's paid. And then he yielded up his life. Friends, tonight, what a Savior. Will you say praise the Lord? Come on, what a Jesus tonight. What a mighty Savior tonight. The debt has been paid in full, and he bows his head and he breathes his last. Oh, what wrath expressed on that cross. Oh, what judgment executed on that cross. But oh, what amazing love displayed on that cross. A love that exceeds all other loves combined. Will you say praise the Lord? Look at me, lady, tonight. God loves you. Look at me, sir, tonight. God loves you. Look at me, young person, tonight. God loves you. And he loved you so much. He sent his only begotten son to pay the penalty for your sins and to be your substitute. There's nobody like him. Will you say praise the Lord tonight? There is nobody like him. He is fantastic. And he is wonderful. Oh, my unsafe friend tonight, God's law exposes your sins. God's law highlights your sins. And God's wrath awaits you. But there's a reprieve. A reprieve for the person, no matter how great a sinner they are, or no matter how great a sinner they have been, there's a reprieve because Jesus loves you. Can I ask you tonight as I finish, what is your response going to be to him? What is your response going to be? You've heard all this tonight. You've heard of the Savior who left the glory of heaven sinless and spotless, undefiled. You've heard about him tonight. You've heard of his love. You've heard of what he has done for you, what he has provided. What is your response going to be to him tonight? Are you going to stay tonight in that dock? Are you going to stay tonight in that place of condemnation? Are you going to throw that awesome love and mercy back in his face? And on that judgment day, stand condemned, stand damned, Cast instead forever in the hellfire. That's the gospel. Hear me. Friend, tonight, if you repent of your sins, if you repent of your sins, those sins that have put you in that dock, and if you exercise faith alone in Christ, and if you take him tonight as your Savior and Lord, he will consider his death as punishment for your sins, he'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you, he'll save you. And this very night, you can leave here saved and leave forgiven. Will you say, praise the Lord? You don't need to go out the same way you come in. You don't need to go out in a condemned state. You don't need to go out under condemnation. You can leave tonight free. 
Will you say amen? You can leave tonight free. You can leave tonight a child of God. Condemnation, wrath, and judgment. Here's the dock. Here's where you stand. Condemnation. Damnation. Wrath. Move over here. What is there? There's love. And there's mercy. And there's grace. Will you move over? Come on, sir, tonight. Will you move over? Will you leave that old dock of condemnation and move over to where there's life and there's love and there's mercy and there's grace? Oh, sir, tonight, call upon him. Oh, lady, tonight, come to him. Oh, young person, tonight, call upon him. For he promises him that calls on the name of the Lord, they shall. Hallelujah, they shall be saved. Oh, friend, he wants to save you tonight. He wants to save you from your sin. He wants to save you from his wrath. Come to him tonight and trust him and give him your heart. And everybody said, and everybody said, The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Nothing stronger, there's nothing stronger, nothing higher, there's nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, and all the glory to the name of Jesus. Sing that again. There's nothing stronger. There's nothing higher, there's nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the honor, all the power, and all the glory to the name of Jesus. The cross, the cross has the fire.
nothing higher, there's nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name. Sing it once more. Nothing stronger, nothing stronger, there's nothing higher. Let's pray, shall we? Our gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for those two persons tonight who indicated their desire to come to the Lord. Gracious Lord, you see them right now. Oh, do a work of grace within their hearts. And gracious Lord, I pray, will you give them the courage to go into the McGee room? And I pray that, Lord, they'll get that literature and they'll, they'll read it and they'll learn. And oh, they'll go right on with thee. Lord, but I feel there's others tonight. Lord, speak to them. Draw them to yourself. Don't let them go home tonight. Lord, until they find thee. And now, Lord, separate us with your blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain and abide upon us until Jesus comes again. <laughs>